Uh, our topic tonight is After the Arab Awakening, Opportunities and Challenges for a New Arab World. <clears throat> uh, before we get started, I would like to thank our uh, sponsors for this event. Uh, it didn't just happen on its own. The uh, Conrad Adenauer Stiftung, uh, policy, German policy think tank, uh, helped us out. I don't know where Tomas is, thank you. Uh, and then uh, our international media partner is, uh, is uh, CNN International. We're very happy for their support. So the question to start segment one is very simple. Is the Arab Spring over? Is the Arab Spring over? And so I'm going to start with uh, Dahlia, who has her finger on the pulse of the Arab world, and just hear what she has to say. Well, I think we, we have to start by asking what started the Arab Spring. And there are certain socioeconomic conditions that created the, condi the, uh, the, the ground for, uh, for what happened in Tunisia, what happened in Egypt. Those conditions have not changed. The other thing that has happened is that people's fear has essentially evaporated. Uh, so when you have conditions and the lack of fear, you would expect these revolts to continue. Uh, the other thing we have to keep in mind is that no one predicted um, these things. The, they are not following linear models. They're, they're quantum in, in nature. So we, we don't know w what's going to happen next. What we do know is that the conditions that created them uh, are still present in many places. OK, that's great. Uh, Shadi, would you like to? Yeah, well, I think even the, the phrase Arab Spring is a bit of a misnomer now because what does spring suggest? Spring suggests flowers blossoming, forward momentum, and we have anything but that right now. And, I, you know, I remember I was actually in Tahrir Square when the announcement that Mubarak was stepping down, the whole crowd just kind of burst out in excitement. And I just remember the euphoria of waking up the day after. <coughs> and it's really kind of sad to see how things have shifted. And I think on my part, I think most of us here, we would have hoped that regimes would use less force, not more force after what they saw in Egypt. But in fact, they are essentially in many places waging war against their own people. And we're seeing that in Libya, Syria, Bahrain, the list goes on. So this is very troubling to see. Leaders don't want to let go of power. And again, we see that in, in Yemen where President Saleh, I think it's um, number th the third or fourth time where yeah. he's been very close to signing a deal, and it hasn't happened. So I think we have to kind of take a step back and try to understand where things have gone wrong and what the role of the international community should be, which is what I think we'll talk about later. That's a very important part of this as well. OK, that's great. Uh, Abdel, uh, uh, let me ask this. Do you, are you surprised by what we're seeing? Uh, Shadi just described how these uh, leaders are holding on to power and using force against their own people. Uh, how, how do you uh, react to that? Actually, yes, uh, I'm absolutely surprised. Uh, uh, it seems those uh, autocratic regimes in the Arab world are learning their lessons, and they realize that uh, they wouldn't uh, let the authority go easily. Uh, what actually, you know, let me first talk about the Arab Spring. It is not our actually terminology to say Arab Spring. We said it is, you know, Arab Revolution. It seems, you know, it is the terminology was chosen by the West, uh, by the Western media. You know, even they chose, you know, the description of our revolutions. We have noticed. I'm worried also about the Western intervention in particular. Western intervention is really making me extremely scared about, not only about the revolution, but also about our future as Arabs in, in, in this region. When I say Western revolution, uh, Western intervention, if you notice, the West intervened twice on the Arab world, by military means, twice, for regime changes. They intervened twice to change regimes in the Arab world, once in Iraq, and the second time is taking place now in Libya. Is it coincidence that these two countries are oil-producing countries? Please think about it. If I could just jump in, where, where's your evidence that oil was the main motivation for the Libya intervention? Why we don't have intervention in Yemen, for example? Why we don't have intervention in Syria? Why we don't have intervention in Bahrain? Could you answer me, please? <laughs> Tark, you want to take that? Uh, right. Tark, Tark. It's time for Tark to jump in, so please. 
It's a, it's a valid <laughs> question. Why, why is there an intervention in Libya, but there has not been an uh, intervention in Yemen or Syria? I think it, it's a fair question. Uh, in the absence of a clear answer, and I think Shadi was pointing to this, one need not jump to the usual suspect uh, and attribute the lack of intervention to perhaps uh, ulterior motives uh, or some pre-orchestrated designs on the, on the part of Western powers. I will be the first one to say, and I disagree with you here, maybe I, but I hope we don't. Uh, I did not want to see the city of Benghazi be subject to a slaughter. And if at that moment I had to call the devil to come and protect my people, I would have shaken the hand of the devil. And quite frankly, I don't find it neither useful or uh, even plausible that one will have to somehow justify this by appealing to some notion of, uh, of, uh, of uh, Arab nationalism or Islamic solidarity uh, or any convention in the world of international politics to justify the call by the people of Benghazi, at least on that 11th hour, for some measure of protection. And I'll end here with where we started off earlier by saying, if 1952, the coup of Abdel Nasser signaled the beginning of the military involvement in Arab political life, then the last coup took place about 20 years later. This process of revolutionary change, involvement of the military, uprooting traditional political establishments, lasted with us for about 20 plus years. The Arab Spring, as we know it today, has the potential of creating dynamics that will stay with us for a while and maybe a long time to come. This is to say that no country is necessarily immune, but no country will also follow the same footsteps of other countries in how change will take place. What fascinates me as an, as, as an analyst, as an observer, as a political scientist, are the change in the parameters of the problem how politics is viewed, how legitimacy is constructed, how people look at their states and their rulers, and how youth in the Arab world evaluate the possibilities for change from this point on. Uh, 2011 is a game-changing year for how the Arab political order internally uh, will turn out for many, many years to come. And I don't buy the notion that we've run out of steam. I think we're just beginning. It's a long process. and I. I'm happy to be a part of this, uh, this moment. Yeah.